Hi, this is Dr. Sue Cooper with a lecture video for Accounting 752 at Towson University. In this video, we're going to be looking at page three of the chapter two lecture notes. Uh, so in the last video, we went over some of the documents that are commonly used in business settings and how those documents translate into journal entries for our financial statements. Let's talk now on page three about data storage. So first of all, we're going to talk about the different kinds of ledgers that we'll have in our accounting information system. We're going to have our general ledger, which will contain all of the uh, accounts that we have and use in uh, producing our financial statements. So it's going to have all your assets, liabilities, equity, revenue, and expense accounts. A subsidiary ledger is a secondary ledger. It looks just like a le general ledger, but it actually uh, includes sub accounts for some of the other more generalized accounts. Two that are the most common accounts that have subsidiary ledgers are accounts receivable and accounts payable. And so there is an example down here at the bottom of an accounts receivable balance. So there's going to be an accounts receivable T account and that main account, ART account, is what we would call a control account. So it's the main account on the regular general ledger called accounts receivable and has a $1,450 debit. But under that umbrella of the AR control account, we're going to have uh, several subsidiary accounts uh, more specifically one for every single one of our customers that we are granting credit, to which we are granting credit. So we'll have a customer A, we'll have a debit of 400, customer B maybe owes us 1,000, and customer C owes us 50. If you add all three of those customers together, that's how we get to the balance of 1,450. Uh, so you're going to have a subsidiary ledger like this for a lot of different balance sheet accounts, and it could even be for some of the income statement accounts. So definitely for accounts receivable and accounts payable, you'll have these. You would maybe also have one for, probably have one for inventory and uh, different payroll liabilities and um, prepaid accounts. So uh these need to be accounted for in any accounting information system. Uh, so if you were, we'll use QuickBooks as an example. When you open the QuickBooks, you will see that there are different lists. And a lot of these lists will actually translate into some kind of a subsidiary ledger under a general ledger account. Uh, accounts receivable, accounts payable are definitely two of those. All right, when you are looking at your chart of accounts and contemplating implementing or um, creating that chart of accounts inside of a computerized system, then what we're gonna, uh, one thing that we're gonna wanna do is make sure that we have unique identifiers for each of the those accounts on that chart of accounts. So the chart of accounts is basically just a list of all the accounts that we have in our general ledger. And we want to code those accounts with a number so that we are able to ensure that we don't duplicate the names or the intentions of any of the accounts on the general ledger. When you have a really good GL accountant or general ledger accountant who is maintaining that chart of accounts and the general ledger, then things will typically run pretty smooth. But in a lot of companies, they're not large enough to have someone who's dedicated to just maintaining that GL. So you will sometimes get duplications of accounts where someone needs to make a transaction or record a transaction or make a journal entry, and they can't find the exact account that they are looking for. And so they'll just create a new one. Um, and then later on, when you're preparing financial statements, you'll find that there are two or three accounts all uh, with the same name or same intention, they really all need to be merged together into one. So using um, numeric codes, block codes, group codes, or mnemonic codes will help to reduce this in your chart of accounts. It'll also help with auditing and checking and following up with uh, documentation uh, and approvals and 
more specifically to track um, sensitive documents like paper checks and um, cash, I suppose, if you were to record serial numbers to keep track and make sure that uh, there are any checks that have been stolen or are missing from the uh, source of blank checks for the company. So here we're gonna talk about different kinds of codes and you can use these for any kind of specific or individual unique identification inside of a computer system. The sequence codes will go in order. So you just go one, two, three, four, five. Items are numbered in order regardless of the item type. An example would be fixed asset tags on company computers. The next computer purchased gets the next number tag off of the sticker roll. So uh, you'll just, as you're tagging assets, you're just pulling the stickers off the roll and they come in a sequential order. And then you write all those numbers down and those assets now have a sequential number that is used to identify the individual tagged assets um, in the fixed asset system. Uh, block codes. This is blocks of numbers that are reserved for specific categories of data. Uh, for example, all asset account numbers must start with a one. And then to carry that on, you would say maybe the liability numbers must start with a two, equity with a three, revenue of four, uh, cost of goods sold, five, uh, other expenses, six, seven, and eight. Uh, that's a typical numbering system for a chart of accounts in a computerized system. Group codes. This is where different parts of the number have different meanings. For example, the area code for Towson, Maryland is 410. This code represents 16 different Maryland counties. Sometimes when you are doing consolidated financial statements for different subsidiaries in a large corporation, you will have account numbers that will designate which um, subsidiary or location is associated with which account. So perhaps you have an inventory account that is for the west location and an inventory account that is for the east location. Uh, the inventory account number for the west location might be 1040 uh, and then a dash and then some kind of indicator to show it's for the West. So a W or an O1. So it's location O1. And then any other um, accounts that are for other locations would then maybe have an O2 or an O3. So the account number itself actually changes based on the location that it's related to. Um, in QuickBooks, uh, there are ways to designate locations that don't require you have a specific account number for each location, but it might be necessary in some larger uh, software applications and ERP systems. Mnemonic, um, mnemonic, I don't know if I spelled that wrong. Mnemonic codes are ID numbers that mix letters and numbers together. So for example, um, a product code or some kind of other identification like the example is DRY300W05. And so each of those little sections of numbers mean something. The 300 means it's a low end appliance. W is for white. DRY is for dryer and 05 means whirlpool. So you can um, use little codes like that to assign meaning to the identification of different items in your information system. So here I've got some uh, account in a chart of accounts and uh, in your notes these areas are blank and so I've just given you some guidelines here at the top and then the note uh, the notes are to then fill in account numbers that could fit in that within those uh, ranges uh, and classifications so we've got here on the left, uh, a list of different current asset accounts. And then on the right, a list of non-current asset accounts. So we've got cash checking, cash savings, accounts receivable, and inventory. And, uh, and all these accounts need to have an account number or an account code that's between 100 and 199. So I started at 101 and 102, and then I jumped to 120 for AR and 150 for inventory. The reason I did this is that sometimes you'll close a cash account and open a new one and you want to give it a new account number that's in sequence with the others. So if we had some other cash accounts, we might want to number those 103, 104. 
And so we'll skip and have gaps in between the different kind of uh, areas on the balance sheets or the chart of accounts, I guess, so that we leave room for expansion and growth. Um, accounts receivable starts at 120 and maybe we'll have two or three accounts receivable accounts. So those could be account 121, 122, so on and so forth. Inventory at 150, you could put the prepaids at 160. So basically you kind of want to spread your accounts out when you first set it up so that you have room to expand and grow. Uh, and then with the non-current assets, I did the same thing. Started at 200 for land, 210 for buildings, 230 for equipment, and then other. We'd also need to add in some accumulated depreciation accounts, obviously, in that area. All right, so that's the end of the notes for page three. In the next video, we'll look at page four.